Someone say praise the Lord. Lord. That leaves y'all with me, amen? (laughs) Father, we thank you for the word of God today. We thank you that every word of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, is yes and amen. Father, I pray for transformed hearts and changed lives. I pray for the power and the presence of precious Holy Spirit to minister to these, your people, Father, that they leave here a little changed, a little transformed by the power of your Spirit, Lord God, and that they would draw a little closer to you, Father, than when they entered this place today in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. You know, I've been doing this series on spiritual warfare, and I want to continue with it today. And next week, as you know, is Resurrection Sunday. Everyone say Resurrection Sunday. Now, I know I'm weird for a lot of reasons, but one is I don't celebrate Easter. I celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. Anybody that knows the Scripture knows that God hates mixing pagan and other things. Amen. So if we're going to celebrate his resurrections that day, that's what it's going to be about. Nothing added to it. How many of you know his resurrection is enough to celebrate? Don't need chickens, don't need rabbits, don't need eggs. Amen? You want chickens, rabbits, and eggs, you've got the rest of the year to eat them or do whatever you do with them. Amen? Um, I think chickens are kosher, rabbits are not. Uh, I did want to share with you guys that we do have some special music planned for you all next week. We've got a couple from our Friday night service, Tim and Jill, who are going to be doing a couple special songs. And so uh, I didn't have a chance to hear them live. They helped with Friday night service when us men were out of town. And so I'm excited. We're going to have our regular praise and worship as well. And then I will have a special message about the resurrection of Jesus, but about his resurrection and how it ties in with spiritual warfare. Quick review of where we've been. We said it's easy to think that the world consists of what we see in our eye window, our eyes every day, and completely miss the larger picture. There is an invisible battle happening all around us. Life and death are fiercely competing for our devotion. How many of you know that death is pulling at you every day and life is pulling at you from the Spirit of God? Amen? We quote it. 1 John 3, 7 and 8, it says, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, Jesus, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, everyone say for this purpose. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Listen to me. This is what sets our Savior apart from all of the religions of the world. Buddha did not come to earth to destroy the works of Satan. Muhammad did not come to planet earth to destroy the works of Satan. Only the risen Lord Jesus Christ has come to planet earth to destroy, not to play with, but to destroy once and for all, all of the works of the devil. Someone say amen. Now I can tell you where he started. In me, in my life, he started at the place of salvation. That's where he destroyed the works of Satan in my life and in your life. Now, that was old hat. You can watch that on YouTube. So that's what we talked about last week. This week, I want to talk about recognizing spiritual warfare. And how many of you know there is a spiritual battle all around us right now? They talked about what happened in Brady and the spirit of prayer going up. And also in Waco, they're doing a 72-day fasting and prayer in the university, being led by university students. I mean, the Spirit of God is starting to move once again on the hearts and minds of God's people to pray. And whenever God's people begin to pray, things begin to happen. Because honestly, prayer meeting is the worst attended meeting always in all churches everywhere. 
You can have a church of 3,000 and call for a prayer meeting and have 20 people show up, just the way it is in America. But the Spirit of God is going to and wanting to and desiring to change that. Someone say amen. So recognizing spiritual warfare, 1 Peter 5, 8 says to be alert. Everyone say be alert. Look at your neighbor, say be alert. If they're sleeping, wake them up. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, your enemy, my enemy, the enemy of every believer's soul, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. How many of you know we are fighting against a real enemy? A real enemy, amen? And this battle is raging right now across our entire nation and actually across and around the entire world. In our nation, they call it culture wars. It's actually a spiritual war, a demonic attack from Satan on the foundations and the morality that this nation was built upon. But it's a spiritual battle. And it's up to the people of God to rise up in righteousness and to rise up in truth. So, number one, we have to be alert. You've got to be awake. You have to know that there is a spiritual battle. How many times people are in issues in relationships in their home or their families or the workplace or whatever, and they're wrestling flesh and blood, they're not alert, they're not sober-minded, and they forget that the enemy is trying to devour their soul. Number one, Satan's strategy is to try to destroy you through intimidation. Everybody say intimidation. You say, well, how does the enemy try to destroy me through intimidation? I'll tell you how. The enemy tries to intimidate us by reminding us of our past failures in our life. How many people here have ever had a past failure in their life? Whew, thank you for your honesty. Everyone, amen? And how many of you know the devil loves to remind you of your past failures to try to keep you from currently, presently doing what the Spirit of God has called you to do? He'll say, well, you know, you can't really do that, brother. Look at all the stuff I remember that you did in your past. How are you going to do houses for healing and do all the things that God's told you to do and be successful? You can't do that. You can't play keyboard, James. Look at all the things in your past. Look at all the failures. You can't do that. And begins to whisper that intimidation in your ear to keep you from fulfilling the purpose and plan of God today. And how many of you know as believers, the only day Heavenly Father is concerned with is today. Because if you're under the blood of Jesus, anything and everything you've ever done is gone forever. I mean, gone, gone. Part of the reason we celebrate communion, Heavenly Father doesn't remember it anymore. The Bible says in Isaiah, he casts it, throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. Had a brother at the men's retreat, we were talking, and I had pulled a little prank on him, a little joke, last year. And he was reminding me of it. I said, brother, I said, do you forgive me? He goes, I do, but I haven't forgotten. And I told him, well, you know, when God forgives, he forgets. Amen? You can't say you forgive and still cling and hold on to those things, amen? Because our Heavenly Father does not do life to you that way, amen? Satan can whisper in your ear all he wants. Don't allow him to intimidate you in the name of Jesus. You are bought with a price. You're no longer your own. You've been purchased by the blood of Jesus, filled with his Holy Spirit, and you belong to the Most High God. And we used to sing as a kid, if the devil don't like it, he can sit on attack. Amen? Also, he intimidates by trying to convince believers that he has power over them and over their circumstances. Satan has no authority and no power, listen to me, 
over the life of a believer whose life is fully and totally submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. No authority, no power. You don't see that in the Word of God. doesn't mean bad things can't happen to a believer. They do all the time. But I can tell you this, that nothing happens outside of that ultimately what God is wanting to accomplish in our life. Even if it's death, then it's time to go. There's something that God's wanting to bring about in life, even in death. Satan is not God over you. Jesus is Lord over you. Simple truth, but simply true. Recognizing spiritual warfare, Satan's strategy is also to try to destroy the believer through isolation. Wounded sheep are easy prey. Isolate it from the fold and cut off. How many of you know it's hard to be isolated by yourself? You know, at our men's retreat, we do this thing with men where we have them go and spend 30 minutes alone to hear the voice of the Lord. They're not allowed to talk, not allowed to pray, just listen. How many of you know it's really hard? How many of you are a little vocacious? That means like to talk a little bit. <laughs> I know I am. Being Just being quiet for 30 minutes. It's like, God forbid, if there's ever a moment of silence in a church service. You know, it's like one of those awkward silences. It's like, oh, my gosh. It's like nobody's saying anything. And God forbid it goes longer than 60 seconds because everybody's just like, oh, my gosh, what are we doing? There's silence. Listen, the enemy works overtime to try to look for those sheep who are wounded, who have allowed themselves to be wounded, who have isolated themselves from the body of Christ, because that's who he's going to try to attack and to pick on and to try to diminish their faith. And the goal, in the end, is to kill you and to destroy you. You are not his pet. You are not his friend. The Bible says Satan comes for one reason but to kill, to rob, and to destroy. He could not have said it in any plainer language for us to understand. In the physical world, if somebody is trying to kill, rob, and to destroy from you, you would think you would do everything you could to outsmart, outwit, and survive. Am I right? So the enemy of your soul, the Bible says, Satan is out to destroy, kill, and to rob from you. And one of the number of ways he does is to try to draw you away off by yourself. You know, it's somebody gets their little feelers hurt somewhere. First thing they do, well, I'm not going to church. I just, I'm not going it's got people there. <laughs> Listen, people are the same everywhere. We will all fail you at some point. Even the preacher, someone say amen. amen. Guaranteed that Jesus will never fail you. So already you need to go in with diminished expectations because God's called us to be a part of a body of believers knowing that we're all kind of a work in progress. Amen? I'm a work in progress. How many of you are works in progress? How many of you just works? No, I'm kidding. We're all works in progress, amen? There's all kinds of people in the body of Christ. Don't allow the devil to isolate you. Here's another thing he does is sin will come in or you'll get involved or trapped into something and all of a sudden, you're pulling yourself away from other believers. Listen, when you mess up, you run to God. Don't run from him. You run to him. Look at your neighbor and say, run to God. You run to him. That's what David did. How many of you know King David messed up several times? Serious ways. I mean, serious ways, right? 
People cut themselves off from the fellowship of the believers. Do you know church is not man's idea? It's God's idea. I was sharing with somebody, maybe Luke, but I was talking about what church is and what it's not. Oh, it was Samuel. We were talking about church. I'm like, what is church? And first he said, well, church is somewhere we go. Church is not where you go. Church is who you are. The actual word for church is called out ones. Ecclesia, you are the called out of God. Whenever you read the word church, it's not talking about facilities. It's talking about a group of people. Everybody say a group of people. It doesn't matter if we're in this sheetrock or if we're in a field, we're still the church. Someone say amen. Now, I'm glad for our sheetrock. I'm glad we're fixing to extend this, by the way. April 25th, they start the concrete on the foundation. For those of you who don't know, we're extending out to sanctuary seat an additional 70 people, so we're pretty excited. But if we met in a field, it wouldn't matter. We're still the church. So church is not place. Church is people. And people cut themselves off from other of God's people. We need each other. Someone say amen. The Father has not called us to be islands unto ourselves. How many of you remember the old United States Army uh, commercial, Army of One? You remember that? Listen, in the kingdom of God, there is no army of one. There's an army of many. We need our brothers. We need our sisters. We need each other. But they're kind of weird. We still need them. Amen? Have you looked at your pinky toe lately? It's a little weird, but it serves a purpose. Someone say amen. So just like the body, the Bible says that we're all many parts, many members of one body. Some members, man, are mouthpieces. Like, wow, I wish I could speak as good as them. Some members are pinky toes. Like, Lord, I know they're there. I don't know what their purpose is, but you do. Amen. <laughs> Maybe to add balance, right? But God has a purpose for every member, has placed every member according to his desire and his design. So don't hide from the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, as we see the day of Jesus approaching, his soon return, as we see the end of time coming and the end of days, we're supposed to be fellowshipping more and not less. But in America, the average attendance is once every three weeks. Man, we have stuff going on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays and Sundays. So even if, and Thursdays, thank you, with the women. So even if you've got a schedule that's this, that, or the other, there's always some way to fellowship if you want to fellowship. Amen? And we need fellowship. How many of you have ever wrestled getting to church. It's like, oh man, I just don't feel like going my flesh. I just want to kick my feet up. And now we've got that online thing, right? So we could just eat breakfast in bed. Some nice sausage, some pancakes, put our feet up and, oh, hallelujah. Good job this morning, Kayla. You're doing awesome. But you know what? It's not the same. We need brotherly contact. Amen. We need one another. I never knew that as much as I did for those three weeks or four weeks, whatever it was, when we shut down. And I got so convicted by the Holy Spirit. I told these guys, we need to have church. And we had church, y'all remember, who were here outside under a tent, right? It's like, I don't care what we do, we're having church. And we will never shut down again for anything. That'd be like the early church saying, you know, they're throwing people to the lions, so we better not meet for a while. Let's just kind of hang out for about six months or a year. Let everything cool down. Maybe nobody will die, and then we'll come back together. Is that what the early church did? Everybody say, no. They just hid. They said, we're going to get together no matter what. We're just going to do it in a little smarter of a way. And they went to the caves and to the catacombs in Rome and wherever they had to do to continue to meet together. Why? Because that's God's will. That's his plan. 
church is not man's plan. Now, I know there's all kinds of man's stuff mixed in. I get it. But the idea of us being together to worship him, that's his plan. Not only is it his plan, but he says this. He says there's something supernatural that transpires when we come together. Because he says we're two or more of my people. Come together as to agreeing with anything, it shall be done. Agreement together with brothers, with sisters. Now, here's an example I want to show you. This is a mega church in Denver. This came out this week in the news. Their facility is $12.5 million. And they decided their online service was so successful, they're selling their building, and they're just going to have online service from now on. So you know what? You don't have to meet with anybody. You don't have to shake that strange person's hand. You don't have to go up there and hug that weird preacher with a hat's head. You can just kick off your shoes. You can just cook some breakfast in bed, and you've got church. Brothers and sisters, that is not church. That is not the way God designed this. Now, I'm not against using the online platform to reach souls or for the bedridden or for those who are sick or infirmed or can't come. I'm all for that, but I'm telling you, there is no replacement in the Word of God for God's people coming together. And you talk about an attack of the enemy, this stuff right here is the devil. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about trying to convince people they don't need their brothers and sisters in person to worship. That is not how Heavenly Father designed this. Someone say amen. I'm just telling you, it's not. Facebook. And I'm telling you, people are wanting to exchange God's world for Mark Zuckerberg's. And I'm telling you, God's world is much better. Much better. Amen. And in this metaverse, they're already planning how church is going to be done. Isn't that amazing? You don't believe me. I want you to watch this. is an online platform where people can use virtual reality headsets to transport themselves to any realm they wish, including church. Jackie Banez explains the appeal of digital worshiping in the metaverse. I believe the future of the church is the metaverse. A growing number of people are turning to the metaverse for their religious services as folks pop on virtual reality headsets and partake in digital church. Uh, let me have someone read uh, verses 19 through 21. But just because it's virtual doesn't mean it's less interactive than going to a physical house of worship. If anything, VR church participants say it enhances their religious experience. I was able to see a rendering of the verse I was reading, which made scripture much more meaningful. Uh, for me. And it's so much more than scripture readings. Baptisms are also taking place in the metaverse. The rebirth that you got through Jesus Christ. Do you want this? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Yes. I baptize you now. But this kind of worshiping isn't just for the tech savvy. Thank you. Turn the lights. Baptism in the metaverse. Listen to me, guys. It sounds like bad science fiction if you didn't hear it and see it and weren't living through it. But listen to me, there's people already, believers embracing this stuff. And again, for the bedridden and those who can't come gather with the believers, I get it. But even then, I think about the man with palsy. Remember he had his friends tear up the roof 
and lower him down so he could be in the presence of Jesus. So there is a supernatural presence that occurs when we're together with more than one of us. His presence is with us. Now, you say, well, that's weird because he lives in us by his spirit, but yet his manifest physical presence supernaturally is compounded when God's people come together. I love that. Amen. I don't want Mark Zuckerberg's world. I want God's world. I want flesh and blood. I want to see real red hair. Amen. <laughs> I want to see real smiles. I don't want to be a little, uh, whatever they call it, a little sim in a, in a, in a, a, a metaverse. Avatar grosses me out and scared me that guy looked like me, that one avatar with the beard and mustache. So listen, guys, don't allow the devil to trick you in these last days. That doesn't mean you can't go on vacation and have a great... I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you, you and I need each other. It's the way God designed it, the way he designed us. Amen? I was sitting in my office this week talking to a couple, praying for them because they want to get back with Jesus, to get back with the Lord, to get back with him, and to get back with each other. Because remember, the cross is twofold, guys. There is a vertical brace that points us in our relationship to God, and there is a horizontal brace that is us in our relationship to each other. I had an old wise friend of mine, Dr. Westbrook. He's 94 now, still alive. But he told me one time when I was a kid, he said, Bruce, church is perfect if it had no people. That's the only, you want a perfect church, it's a church with nobody in it. Because people are imperfect. And any time you take imperfect people and put them together, you're going to have an imperfect thing. <laughs> it's funny. Because you know what? Heavenly Father uses imperfect people to shape us and mold us and to build character in us. Amen? And I thank God for that. I look around here even this morning. Here we are. You may not know this, but it was Resurrection Sunday next week, which is the seventh year anniversary of my first time preaching in this congregation. <clears throat> it was a Resurrection Sunday. There was 12 people here. And the Holy Spirit said, Bruce, this is where I want you to be. And you know what? I can tell you this, guys. In the last seven years, I've seen Satan work harder to destroy what church is supposed to be than ever before in my lifetime. And I've been ministering for 35, 36 years. With COVID, when all these churches shut down, did you know a lot of them never started back up? Did you know a lot of people who left because of COVID, the excuse, never came back even when the church is open? Why do you think that is? It wasn't fear. I'll tell you what it is. It's because the enemy had tricked them. And it really separated those who were committed from those who weren't. Man, I'm telling you what, guys, there's stuff coming down the pike, not to scare y'all, but if you're not rooted in him now, you're going to have a terrible time in the future. I'm just telling you it prophetically by the Spirit of God. A poll of a 1,000 Protestant pastors done by Lifeway Research between September 1st and September 29th of this past year, found that while 98% of Protestant churches were again available for worship services in person, attendance is still much below pre-pandemic times. Why was that? Because the enemy has cut them off, isolated those individuals to pull them away from the body of Christ. It is a ploy, a scheme, an attack of the enemy, and you have to know it. Points. 
I'm not. I'm just telling you. So bear with me a couple more minutes, okay? And I'm feed, we're feeding you, right? We've got beef hot dogs and hamburgers. Listen, I made some homemade chili to go with lunch. So we've got, you know, chili, it's spicy, chili dogs. Some of y'all brought desserts and salads and some delicious food. You said, well, I didn't know anything about it. You're a visitor. Please come eat with us. We've got more food than you can imagine. Amen. So come fellowship with us afterwards over here. Save some money at the restaurants and enjoy some fellowship with some amazing people. Amen. But number two, God is the source of all good. Satan is the author of evil. You just need to know that. God is the source of everything good in your life. Listen, as simple as that sounds, you've got to know that in your heart. God wants good for your life. He is your father. How many of you mothers, dads, grandmothers would ever wish anything evil on your children? No. So why do you think Heavenly Father would want anything but the best for your life? But him wanting you to have the best and you having the best is determined by your submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ and your obedience to the word of God. If you're always disobedient to his word, if you're always struggling, always doing things your way rather than God's way, then don't be surprised when things don't go as you'd like them to go. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Plain and simple. God does not bring temptation into your life. Someone say amen. Amen. How many of you agree that the Bible's true? Just a fact. Every man's tempted, the Bible says, when you're drawn away by your own lust and you're enticed. So we do it to ourselves. And then Satan's there whispering in your ear to amplify that. Now, why is that important? Because you have to know that God has good in store for you and good planned for you. He's not out trying to tempt you every day to sin. That is not the God we serve. Satan brings temptation, but more importantly, your flesh brings temptation. So what do I do? You learn to battle the flesh, to put down the flesh, and walk after the Spirit. If you live and follow after the flesh, the book of Romans says, and the Spirit of God says, you will die spiritually, spiritual death, plain and simple. If a believer is walking after the flesh, you're walking after spiritual death. Didn't you teach on that in the foundations, right? Just a fact. Every good gift. Everybody say every good gift. How many of you like good gifts? I love good gifts, amen? Every good gift, every perfect gift is from who? Above. And comes down from the Father of lights, 1 John 1, 5, because I wrote this little note here, I wrote this, 1 John 1, 5, because it says God is light, and in him is no shadow of turning. God is light, amen? So if anybody says that they're walking after the Lord and there's darkness in their life, then there's a disconnect, there's an issue, there's a problem there, right? With whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So every good gift, every perfect gift is from Heavenly Father. That means that there is a battle on when you've got gifts that aren't so good coming your way. You've got mental distress and fear and anxiety and depression and discouragement and all the other things that the world tries to bathe into your life. You've got to fight those things. You've got to wrestle those things. They're not from God. I'm going to quit on three. This is going to be my last one for today. The battle is real. Everybody say the battle is real. It's not a virtual battle, amen? You don't get, it's not like a video game where you get to spawn or respawn with more and more lives. This is a real battle. Men and women, souls, and their eternal fate is at stake. I take that super serious. Super serious. The battle's real. 
Galatians 5.17, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition, opposed, at enmity, at war with one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Close those doors, please. I've got too much noise out there distracting me. Is that me preaching in the nursery that I'm hearing? Oh, well, tell, him, tell that preacher to turn himself down. <laughs> He's distracted himself. Amen. Like, it sounds like my voice. <laughs> For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. But these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Every human being here, within the sound of my voice, has this flesh, this body that you live in, right? And everyone within the sound of my voice, if you're a believer in Jesus, has the Spirit of God within you. And there is this warfare that transpires in our life on a daily basis, this wrestling, this fight between flesh and the Spirit. Or am I the only one? And every day, you and I have to be in prayer, submitted to Christ, to allow ourselves to walk after the Spirit. For those who live and walk after the Spirit have life. Everybody say life. Man, if Satan offers death, God offers life. Then why are so many believers born again, but living and following after darkness and death? Life is there for us, saints. We just have to grab hold of it. Amen? Don't give in to the flesh. Don't be mistaken. The picture that we have of Satan is not how he began. And how many of you know, you talk about the devil, and all of a sudden everybody's picturing Hollywood. But Hollywood glorifies everything that God hates. So he's glorified Satan where he paints him as the good guy. In these movies and shows oftentimes, or somebody that's been unjustly treated by God. God is good all the time. Satan used to be the chief of all the angels who served at the side of God. He was the most beautiful cherub, most knowledgeable angel, the chief of the cherubs, the Bible says. But when he got caught up in his own beauty and decided that he wanted God's job he led one-third of the angels in rebellion against the creation, against the creator. And those angels are now what we refer to as fallen angels. Everybody say fallen angels. This is the scripture, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to hell, to the lowest depths of the pit, says God. So Satan said, I will Six times, five times, and God said you won't once. God wins. Amen? He wins. So Satan is always trying to exalt himself above the things that God honors and God desires. And he tries to do it in our life and through our life. And he bombards you, and we talked about this in Sunday school. I'm going to close with this thought. He does this by bombarding you with the world, with worldly media, with worldly movies, worldly music, with all this stuff to ensnare and trap to get you to stop thinking God's perspective on your life and to start thinking the world's perspective on your life. God says you are forgiven, you are redeemed, you are a son and daughter of the Most High God. God says you've been sealed with His Holy Spirit. God says that no weapon formed against you can prosper. God says you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. 
God's word says you're a child, a son, and a daughter of the Most High God. God says that everything in your past is gone and past at last, that you're a new creation, a new creature in Jesus Christ. So let's live like that. Let's live like that. Amen? Let's all stand to our feet. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we love you. We bless you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Father, for the power and anointing of your Holy Spirit that encourages us, Lord. And, Father, we're just on these first three of 12 points, Lord, but, Father, I pray that something said, something spoken, Lord, maybe has convicted our heart, convicted our life, Lord. Maybe we've been living after the flesh, Lord, but we need to walk and live after the Spirit, Lord. Father, on this Palm Sunday, when the multitudes cry out, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, Hoshiana to God in the highest, Lord. Let our hearts cry out, Lord, that we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, Lord, that we want to walk as the men and the women of God. We want our families to reflect the life of Jesus Christ. We want our homes to reflect the Spirit of God. We want our workplace and our play place and the music and everything to reflect who you've made us to be, Jesus. And, Father, I know that we're all a, a, a work in progress, Lord. 